A good test of anything is to simply ask, is the Word of God at the center? Is the Word of God uncensored? Because if the Word of God isn't at the center, then Jesus isn't at the center. If the Word of God isn't honored, then Jesus isn't honored. Because Jesus and His Word are one. We're just going to read Habakkuk uh, chapter 2. Praise the Lord. Habakkuk chapter uh, 2. Uh, if we can just... Thanks. Um, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart. If we can read it out loud together. There's something about the proclamation of God's word out loud. So if we can have it on the screen. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Matthew 28 and 18, Jesus said, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Mark 16 and verse 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation and the new living. He told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. The contemporary English says, then he said, go and preach the good news to everyone in the world. And so these verses, of course, address uh, the Great Commission. It's a phrase I've used many times over the years in, in my sermons. And yet, surprisingly, a 2019 survey found that the majority of church goers in the USA were from unfamiliar with the term. And, uh, and I'm sure if it's like that in the USA, it's, it's um, like that uh, Europe would be no different. And even the minority of believers who are actually familiar with the term, um, 25% of them were not able to explain what it was. Only 17% of believers um, were familiar with the phrase and its meaning, uh, the Great Commission. And so the Great Commission, put simply, is the call to spread the good news of the gospel um, to the world, converting people to faith in Christ, but not just converting, uh, but rather teaching and training them to follow and obey Him so that in time, uh, they by the power of the Holy Spirit may be able to uh, make disciples too. Because Jesus, it's interesting, said, go and make disciples. And then He followed on by saying, teaching them to obey. And, um, uh, and so, while it's beyond doubt that the Great Commission is our mission, uh, we won't fulfill the Great Commission without vision. And that's why over these weeks, um, I'm, I'm sharing, uh, I guess, our vision as a church, but also within a larger scheme, the Great Commission, uh, the vision that Christ has given to us. And so, the fact that so few believers uh, seem to understand the, uh, the meaning of the term or its implications... Uh, for how we uh, live and how we give. And, and I think that both of them are linked to each other because ultimately your giving uh, is tied in with your living. It's a reflection of, of what you believe, what you stand for, what you value. And so, uh, like I said, the fact that so few believers seem to grasp the, the meaning of the term or its implications is a disturbing indication of how ineffective we have been in instilling vision in our people. Proverbs 29, 18 says this, Where there is no vision, the people perish. And that is exactly what happens when the church has no vision. Lost people perish needlessly in their sin. 2 Kings 7 and 9, Then they said to each other, We're not doing what is right. This is a day of good news, and we are keeping it to ourselves. 
uh, the new American standard. We're not doing right. This is a day of good news, but we are keeping silent. If we wait until morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. Because ultimately, it isn't about just going to heaven. It's about making a difference on this earth. We need to take this message to others. And yet so many believers are just like this verse says, keeping silent. You know, we have a divine mandate to go and tell the king's household that Jesus Christ lives. And this is exactly what the early church did. Uh, they went to the ends of the world with this. They, they boldly went with this message of hope through Jesus Christ to what was a violent pagan world. You know, I thank God they didn't buy into the mantra of stay home, stay safe. Or uh, many of our ancestors would never have heard the gospel message. You know, in spite of great risk, they went. But why? Because they were men of vision. Because in an era when travel was, uh, you know, difficult, dangerous, and expensive, they literally traveled the globe with the message of the gospel, not only enduring great trials, dangers, and hardships, but eventually giving their very lives as a final witness to the truths that they had proclaimed. James, the brother of John, beheaded in 44 AD in Jerusalem. According to tradition, the man who led James to his death was so moved by his bold and unwavering confession of Jesus that he was converted and beheaded along with James. Paul the apostle, beheaded in Rome in 67 AD during the reign of Nero. Peter, on the very same year, crucified upside down on the cross at his own request because he considered himself unworthy to die in the same manner as his Savior. Andrew went to um, uh, uh, Cynthia, um, an area including Kazakhstan, Russia, East and Southern Ukraine, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Belarus, Bulgaria, Poland, Albania, and Greece. He was crucified at, uh, uh, on 60 AD on an X-shaped cross on the orders of Aegeus, the Roman governor in the city of Pataras, Greece. He had him bound with ropes rather than nails so that he would suffer for longer. And yet, amazingly, for two days, he preached the gospel from his cross to a crowd of 20,000 people. And on the third day, apparently, there was a flash of light and Andrew went home in glory. Bartholomew, or Nathaniel, he went to Armenia, India, Yemen, Mesopotamia, that's modern-day Iraq, Kuwait, Turkey, and Syria. He also went to Persia, which is modern-day Iran, Egypt, Greece, and on the shores of the Black Sea. He was martyred in Armenia. He was either beheaded, crucified, or skinned alive. Take your choice. James, son of Alphaeus, he ministered in Israel. He was killed by pagans in Egypt. Jude ministered in Judea, Samaria, Idumea, Syria, Iraq, and Libya. Beaten to death in Syria or Iran about 65 AD. Matthew preached in Israel for 15 years. Then he went on to minister in Armenia, Iran, Greece, and Syria. Burned, stoned, or beheaded in Ethiopia. John, who was brought before the Roman emperor, Domitian, who demanded that he burn incense as part of a pagan ritual to save his life. When he refused, the emperor, and, and we don't, you know, think about it. When he refused, I mean, the, nobody refused the Caesars anything. And yet this man, in the face of, of this tyrant, refused uh, to comply. The emperor was understandably irate and had him thrown into a vat of boiling oil. Amazingly, it didn't kill him. It actually didn't harm him at all, at which Domitian was terrified and banished him to the island of Patmos in Greece. Matthias, he was chosen to replace Judas. He was either killed in Turkey or Ethiopia. Philip went to Turkey and was martyred in Herapolis. Thomas went to Iraq and Iran, and brought the gospel to Kerala in the west coast of India. He also went to the east coast. He was speared to death near Madras and is known as the apostle to India. S S Simon the Zealot took the gospel to Egypt 
the area around the Black Sea, North Africa, Iraq, Armenia, Georgia, and possibly even Britain. Tradition states that he was sawn in two at Suenir, Iran. You know, truly, these were men of great courage and vision. They lived such a selfless life, which is very hard for us to, to comprehend in our modern, superficial, narcissistic society. In this modern consumer society where it's all about me. Uh, the sacrifice of these men convicts me and makes me deeply uncomfortable. And yet, it also inspires me. Because, you know, since the first time I got saved 30, 32 years ago, I've heard the, the, the sound of the nations. And yet, 32 years later, I, 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 I think of how, you know, few nations I've gone to and how little I've done for the Lord. And, and I look at these men and what they did and, and the commitment they gave to the gospel. You see, there were men of courage and vision and the two go together I think it's important to understand because ultimately it is vision that gives us courage and conviction Acts chapter 26 Paul said I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision you see Paul was given a vision by God and it it, it motivated him it drove him and um, uh, verse 12 says while thus occupied as journeying to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests. At midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, greater than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking and saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. That's why we've got to have a heart for the church. Christ is one with his church. Paul was, Saul was persecuting the church and yet Jesus said, you are persecuting me. So I don't buy into this thing that you can be isolated and just watch a TV screen and do your own thing. Who is your church and who is your pastor? Or rather, where is your church and who is your pastor? They are two of the most important questions you are going to answer after who is your Savior and your Lord. Because your Savior has to do with heaven, but you need to be planted and part of a church. You need to belong somewhere. Don't just float. You know, dead things float. Amen? Be planted somewhere. Be a member of a local church body. And it says, And I said, to you, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus. I am Jesus. Not I was. He is not the great I was. He is the great I am. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't know what your issue is. I don't know what your, the, the storm you may be in or the battle you may be facing or the, the giant you may be standing before. But know this, we serve a living God. His name is Jesus and he is alive. He arose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But now arise and stand to your feet for I have appeared to you for this purpose. To make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. We're a sent people. To, sent to do what? To open their eyes. In order to turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan to God. Uh, that they may receive uh, remission of sins. And an inheritance among all those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. This is why these men and women went in the face of great danger and trials and, and challenges. Because they understood that it's about light and darkness. It's about heaven and hell. 
To turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Let me tell you this. I'm going to give you an opportunity at this end of this sermon to give your life to Jesus Christ. If you've never been born again or saved, you need to respond to it. Because it doesn't matter how educated, how cultured, how accomplished, how wealthy you are. If you are not born again, you belong to Satan. And you will go to hell. And your religion will not save you. Your goodness will not save you. Your virtue will not save you. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Could somebody say amen today? I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. They had seen and heard something that no one else could see or hear. And because of this, they were faithful even unto death because they had a vision of the crown of life which Jesus will give to all those who serve him. Revelation 2.10, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Thank you, Jesus. They had a vision of Christ and his coming kingdom and that enabled them to defy emperors and to cross oceans and to endure hardships and to stand before wild barbarian people with a message of life and liberty through Jesus Christ. You see, this vision even gave them strength to lay their lives down in the cause of Christ. Because for them, no cost was too high, no distance too far, no sacrifice too great, no threat too daunting. They were men of vision. Patrick had a vision of Ireland 1,500 years ago. A land that he had just escaped from as a slave. And a land that if he went back to as an escaped slave, it meant a death sentence. And yet he came. And interestingly, the vision came in the form of a sound. An angel came with letters and it it says, uh, uh, on one of them was written, the the, the voice of the Irish, Vox Hiberniae. And he heard the cries of the Irish people. And this man answered that call to come back to this nation, even under the threat of of death. He came and uh, he heard a sound, the sound of the Irish. And I believe that a sound will go forth from this nation once again. And Ireland will once again touch the nations with the sacred fire from the throne of God in Jesus' name. I believe that. You see, Europe was re-evangelized by the Irish. That's historical fact. Because monks went forth from this little island with the gospel. And the first port of call was Great Britain. Where they established um, Iona and then Lindisfarne. And, uh, and, and, and from uh, Great Britain, these, these monks went forth then to, to evangelize Europe. And, and this is why... I I truly believe God has a supernatural connection, not just between uh, the Republic and Northern Ireland, but between uh, the Republic of Ireland and Great Britain. There's something in the spirit. And I know at times there's been a lot of hatred and resentment and and strife, but I, I believe under that it's because the devil doesn't like the fact that there is something in the spirit between Ireland and Britain, because it was from these two islands that the gospel went forth throughout Europe. And, and so, you know, I believe God wants to do something again. So praise God for, for Great Britain and their people in Jesus name. Could somebody say amen? amen? Come on, say it this morning. God bless the British. See, for some of you, that just set you free. Just, just to say that, it just sets you free. And it's, uh, like I said, they went forth from Ireland with the gospel uh, to Europe in the midst of the devastation, darkness, and despair that was caused um, as a result of the fall of Rome and the sacking of Rome by the Vandals and the Goths. And, and they established monasteries um, throughout uh, Britain and Europe that became centers of Christian learning and influence. And what moved these men and women to leave behind their native land and to lay their lives down for people they didn't even know? Vision. Vision. And this is what we must grasp. I remember 30 years ago, I was in Bolton Street in the gym, just working out as a a 19-year-old kid. And there was another guy in the gym, and uh, he looked foreign, because back then, everybody was Irish. When I came to Dublin 30 years ago, it was, was, you know, 99.9% Irish people, really. And, uh, but I remember I was in the gym, this this guy looked foreign, and, and I was just working out, and... 
I, I didn't feel anything for this guy, but I just felt the Lord prompt me, you need to go to talk to that man. And he was from uh, Bulgaria. And I started sharing the gospel with him. And as I started sharing the gospel, um, uh, I, I just felt a love for this man. And he got born again right there in the gym. And, you know, it's amazing. I walked in and he was a stranger, but I walked away and he was a friend. And, and this is what the Lord wants to do in our hearts if we allow him to. Amen. He wants to open our eyes. So they, they, they were moved by vision. And, and now these men and women who went before us are members of the, the heavenly cloud of witnesses. And they're cheering us on in our race. That's why the book of Hebrews 12 says, um, uh, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. You know, that word uh, witness in the Greek is martyrs, where we get the word martyr, our record, our witness. Their life was a witness. Their life bore record to the fact that, that they believed that Christ was alive. And they believed it so much they were willing to lay their lives down in, in the cause of Christ and the gospel. And yet all of these men and women are now part of that heavenly um, cloud of witnesses who are in heaven. And they are cheering us on to run our race and to, and to do the will of God in our generation. Amen. They did what they could. Have we done what we can? They gave their all. And so, in light of Christ's sacrifice and the example of these courageous men and women, we must give God our very best and hold nothing back. 2 Timothy 4, 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Tesh. I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. You see, Nehemiah was one of those men who carried the torch that has now been passed to us. It's in our hands now. And so we were looking uh, last week at principles that we see in the life of Nehemiah in terms of the fulfillment of the vision that God gave him for the, the, uh, the, the, the reestablishment of, of Jerusalem, the rebuilding of the walls. Um, and, and so because that was a tremendous shame back then and that day. Um, and that's what the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, like a, a city like walls is, is, is a man who has no self-control and uh, a city broken down without walls because it's indefensible. And, and so Nehemiah I had a vision, so there are principles we can learn um, from that, which I believe we can apply to the vision in this church and, and, and the vision, uh, you know, that I believe God wants to see established in this city. And the first one was this, pray. We looked at it last week, but I love that verse in Nehemiah 2, verse 4, when he stood before the king, and I prayed to the God of heaven. As, as he stood before the, 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 the king, he who held the, li the, the power of life and death, the one who was an ultimate authority um, in that land and in that region, and, and Nehemiah felt very small, but Nehemiah reached beyond the king and he said, and I prayed to the God of heaven. There is a God of heaven. There is a God in heaven and he sits far above the nations. He sits far above every dictator and despot and government and ruler and, and entity and organization. And that's why, again, he looks down at Klaus Schwab and he laughs. He looks at Bill Gates or the WEF or the UN or any of these other entities that want to try to rule your life and try to, you know, set up their little kingdoms on this earth. God looks at them and he laughs. Why? He is the God of heaven. He is the ruler he is the lord he is the king in jesus name pray nehemiah accomplished a great work in rebuilding the walls of jerusalem but it's clear that that vision was birthed sustained and completed by prayer that's why revivals generally don't last is because the prayer that birthed them generally dies out once the revival comes it was birthed, sustained, and completed by prayer. D.L. Moody. Every great movement of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. Martin Luther. To be a Christian without prayer is more possible than to be alive without breathing. Hudson Taylor. When we work, we work. When we pray, God works. Oh, Jesus. 
You know, we had a wonderful meeting a couple of weeks ago with Pastor Paul, um, uh, just a little over a week ago, actually, but uh, um, he, he was saying to me, it's wonderful that you have so many people going on the street to win souls, and I think it is wonderful. But he asked me a question, he said, how many people are actually praying um, for them while they're on the street? And I thought that was a, a, a really a good question. And, and so I would encourage you just to keep us in prayer. You may not be able to, you know, like I said, you might be at home with your kids or you might be uh, doing whatever, but, you know, keep this, this vision and this work in prayer and keep what we're doing in prayer. Hosea 10 and verse 12. Sow to yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground because it is time to seek the Lord. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's time to seek the Lord. Till he comes and rains righteousness on you. You see, it's prayer that prepares the ground for revival. And again, I believe this end time move will be a revival of prayer, repentance, and the proclamation of God's word. It's not revival if it doesn't have those three things. Because again, I believe the preaching of the word is an essential element in revival. Because it's prayer, repentance, and the word of God that opens the hearts of men and women for awakening. They're all essential elements of revival. Let me say this. I have never seen people walk out offended after a song. But I honestly can't say that I, can, I've, I could count how many times I've seen people get up and walk out during a message. You see, worship is a key part of revival. But the angel didn't tell the disciples in Acts chapter 5 verse 19 when he released them from prison, go out and hold a worship service. He said, rather, go out and tell the people all the words of this life. That's not negating the power of worship. It's just acknowledging that Jesus didn't say, go and make a choir. He said, go and make disciples. And that can't happen unless the word of God is being preached. That's why Paul said to Timothy in his final words, preach the word. He says, I charge you. This was a charge that Paul gave to Timothy. Paul knew his end was in sight. And he said, I charge you, therefore. Before uh, God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Not social justice, not climate change, not LGBTWXYZ. Preach the gospel, preach the word, preach the truth. Be instant in season, not a season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. We're living in those days. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up some, for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth. We're living in that generation where whole denominations are turning their ears away from the truth. We saw that just a few weeks ago with the Church of England. They're turning their ears away from the truth uh, that God has revealed regarding marriage, sexuality, gender. It's very, very clear. It's in the very first page. And yet their whole church is turning away from it. And so let me say this. We're not making disciples if the word of God isn't being preached in power. I'm not just talking about simply reading a scripture in public. I'm talking about preaching the word of God. You see, Jesus stood in the temple and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He read from the book of Isaiah. And he, but it's only when he finished by applying that word and saying, today this word is fulfilled in your hearing that suddenly they all went berserk. And there's something about preaching that provokes the devil. He doesn't like it. That's why the first thing they did during the, the whole COVID uh, shenanigans is, is they shut down the churches. There's power in the word of God. Amen. All I'm saying is this. A good test of anything is to simply ask, is the word of God at the center? Is the word of God uncensored? Because if the word of God isn't at the center, then Jesus isn't at the center. If the word of God isn't honored, then Jesus isn't honored. Because Jesus and his word are one. And so I believe in these days, we're going to see many mega churches closing because they no longer preach the full gospel. Because they're tiptoeing around and avoiding this and avoiding that. We don't speak about that. We're all about love. We're all about tolerance. No, we are first and foremost, foremost about truth. Truth. The truth will set you free. 
What, what it does to your feelings is entirely up to you. I can't control how you respond when the truth goes forth. But I have a God-given responsibility to proclaim the truth to my generation, just as these men and women who went before me. I don't want to stand before these men and women ashamed. Well, I, I was afraid I was going to lose my job, or I was afraid that people would defriend me, or that people would label me this, that, or the other. You can label me what you want. I don't care. I'm going to preach this gospel till the day I die in Jesus' name. First John 4, 1 to 6. In the message, my dear friends, don't believe everything you hear. Carefully weigh and examine what people tell you. Not everyone who talks about God comes from God. There are a lot of lying preachers loose in the world. Here's how you test for the genuine spirit of God, everyone who confesses openly his faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came as an actual flesh and blood person, comes from God and belongs to God. And everyone who refuses to confess, confess faith in Jesus has nothing in common with God. This is the spirit of Antichrist that you heard was coming. Well, here it is, sooner than we thought. My dear children, you come from God and belong to God. You've already won a big victory over those false teachers for the, spirit, uh, in, for the spirit in you is stronger than anything in the world. These people belong to the Christ denying world. They talk the world's language and the world eats it up. How was interesting at Meghan Markle's uh, wedding. Everybody was going on about this, this great preacher and it was wonderful. He talked about love. When two people love each other. Beautiful. It's lovely to talk about love. But even the devil could give that sermon about love in an abstract sense. It's not when two people love each other. The Bible says it's when a man and a woman love each other. And so we're seeing the arising of this antichrist church, this Christ-denying church, this truth-denying uh, church. That, that will acknowledge Jesus Christ as ultimate Lord and ultimate arbiter of truth. Because a generation that is increasingly disengaged or insulated from eternal truth, we need to pray that God will prepare the hearts of people to receive the unadulterated word of God. James 1 and 21. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the in in implanted word which is able to save your souls. You know, I appreciate those of you who come in early before the service to pray. Because your prayers may mean the difference between a person hearing, coming, uh, between a person hearing it or, or turning back after some issue. Or, 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 or the difference between, you know, somebody hearing and having their life transformed and somebody just walking in and without, uh, uh, out of the church with no change whatsoever. We have to pray. I mean, how many couples end up staying at home because they had a fight on Saturday night or Sunday morning on the way to church? Why is that? The devil does not want you in church. Or your boss keeps scheduling you to work on Sunday morning. Or you suddenly feel sick or tired or exhausted on Sunday morning. These aren't coincidences. The enemy is at work. And that's why the book of Ephesians chapter 6 says, Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Amen? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So know this, he is plotting night and day to destroy you, your family, and everything that you love. And it goes through the armor of God. And it's interesting that it finishes by talking about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But it doesn't end there. It says, um, praying always with all prayer and supplication. And so the sword, a Roman sword, was, was relatively sh short. But here you have the lance of intercession. And you could keep your enemy at a distance. Fact is, Derek Prince went even further. And he called prayer God's intercontinental ballistic missile. Amen? Because when we pray, we can, we can change nations. We can, you know, there is no distance in prayer. And so praying with all prayer. And I would ask you to pray over this vision. So the first point, that was just my recap from last week, to pray. Secondly, grow. Grow. We have a responsibility to grow. 
because God gives us a vision on where we are to, to grow, on where we are to go. Amen. God gives you a vision on where you are to go. But the reality is this. You will not be able to go until, unless you grow. And this is why God wants us to grow up. We need to grow in maturity. And that means you can't be calling me on the phone every five minutes or getting offended over the littlest thing. Pastor John walked by me and he didn't say hello to me. Well, you know, maybe I was busy or maybe I was distracted or maybe I just don't like you. I knew it. I knew it. He looked over at me when he said that. No, no. I love you all. Okay, but let me say this. A mark of maturity is you learn to take responsibility for yourself. It is time for us to grow up before we go up. The call is going to come, but let's make sure we grow up before that, that call comes for us to go up. Because I've no doubt that this vision will be realized, but we need to grow spiritually, emotionally, financially, numerically. You know, and, and so God wants us to grow. 1 Corinthians 3 and 6, it says... I, I, you know, I had a very vivid dream during the week, and in the dream, there was a, 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 Brazil, a Brazilian man with a beard met me at the front door of his house, and I walked into the house, and he was leading me around this house, and, and it was huge, and each room was bigger than the other, and uh, I remember at, at some stage saying, man, this guy is, is really, really blessed, and uh, the dream finished, the Lord just said to me, he says, I'm sending in the paymasters. And so, you know, we have a vision, and I believe God's going to start sending people in with uh, money that we can do what we're called to do in Jesus' name. Amen? Could somebody say, you know, just this morning, I got a call from a friend of mine who's a pastor in this city, Pastor Emmanuel, and he said, he just took up a collection for our building. He, he says, we, we have a collection of a thousand euros we want to sow into your building project. So, praise the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> See, some of you are offended right now because I'm talking about money. But you know what? You can't see a vision fulfilled without money. Amen? So anyway, we have to grow. Amen? And so 1 Corinthians 3.6, I have planted a polis water, but God gave the increase. Where God guides, he provides. Yes. Amen. And it may be true you. You see, we're believing God big. And a big vision requires big givers. And so I'm just a reminder that the last five, six years, we have a building fund. And we're, like I said, we appreciate you getting behind the vision so we can get our own building in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we're believing for that God-given growth on every level. Growth in maturity, growth in members, in finances, in impact, in favor, and in anointing. But to do that, we first have to grow in love. Because God is love, and love never, ever fails. 1 John 4 and 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. For in this the love of God was manifested, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another because giving or evangelizing or serving isn't difficult when you're loving. Talking to people about Jesus isn't difficult when you genuinely care about their souls. I asked the question last week, how big is possible? In truth, it's related to the question, how big is your heart? You know, we love to quote Isaiah 54 and 2, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out your tent curtains wide and do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. Enlarge our tents. Great. But before we can enlarge our tents, we first have to enlarge our hearts. Psalm 119, 31. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Oh, do not put me to shame. <clears throat> I will run the course of your commandments. For you shall enlarge my heart. Amen? God wants us to grow. And you have not grown until you've grown in love. You have not grown until your heart gets bigger. You, you might have grown in knowledge, experience, wealth, fame, strength, skill, influence, ability. But that means nothing without love. 1 Corinthians 13. It says, you know, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, 
I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Amen. And so God wants us to grow in love. Philippians 1.9 so this is my prayer, that your love will flourish and that you will not only love much, but well. Think about that. Don't just love much, love well. Learn to, be, uh, learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and, not, and uh, uh, test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. Live a lover's life, circumspect and exemplary. A life Jesus will be proud of. Are you living a life that Jesus would be proud of? How many believers on the Saturday night are out in the club on Sunday morning? Praise the Lord. They're singing like Paul the Apostle is risen from the dead. No, God wants us to change. Because this vision will not come to pass without love. You know, the Lord wants to stretch our hearts. He wants us to love people the way He loves them. And we can only do that if our hearts get bigger. I love the line from The Grinch by Dr. Seuss. This happens after the, the Grinch steals Christmas, and yet Christmas happens nonetheless. And let me read. And the Grinch with his Grinch feet, ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came, he's talking about Christmas, it came without ribbons, it came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags, and he puzzled and puzzled till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. What if Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store? What if Christmas perhaps means a little more? And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And then the true meaning of Christmas came true, and the Grinch found the strength of ten Grinches Plus two, plus two. Think about that. It says his heart grew three sizes. Because ultimately, we will use things and love people, or we will love things and use people. And that's why we need to grow, to, we need to grow in love. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's time to grow up. Luke chapter 1 and verse 80. And so the child grew. This is talking about Jesus. And so the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the time of his manifestation to Israel. 2 and verse 40. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. You see, if Christ truly is our example, then we need to commit to grow up into Christ-likeness. Christ grew and we must grow. John 13 and verse 35. By this everyone will know you're my disciples if you love one another. We need to grow in our love. And in order to do that, we need to deal with the selfishness in our hearts. You know, Romans 12 and 9 says, let love be genuine, unfeigned, and without hypocrisy. It says, love, let love be without hypocrisy. And so that means unfeigned and uh, genuine. You see, too many believers are trying to pass off fake love and the world can smell it a mile away. Is your love real? You know, the church I see by faith loves genuinely and it starts with you and me. You see, it's not love to lie to people or to bury the truth of the scripture. As a pastor, I believe I'm called to proclaim it loud and clear for all to see and hear. And, you know, again, whether you accept or reject it is entirely up to you. But the Bible is the key to spiritual growth. John 17 and 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. You see, there's a supernatural power in God's word that will change your heart and cause you to grow if you determine to read it and obey it. John 1, 22. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and every expression of evil and humbly accept the word planted in you, which will save your souls. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Otherwise, you're deceiving yourselves. How many believers worldwide are deceiving themselves? Because they hear the word, they hear the word, they hear the word, but they never obey the word. vast majority of marriage counseling would be uh, utterly unnecessary if both spouses would simply obey the word. 
Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. You see, the church growth movement failed because they saw growth as bums on seats rather than hearts on fire. And consequently, the proclamation of eternal truth was ignored. A key question in eternity will be this. What did you do with truth? Did you embrace and apply it or ignore and deny it? John, uh, Luke 12 and verse 48. To whom much is given, much will be required. You know, Prime Minister Winston Churchill said this. I bind in the name of Jesus Christ every spirit of sleepiness in Jesus' name. This message is too important to sleep through or be dozy through. I just ask you to stay with me on this. This message is important. We say, oh Lord, bring revival, bring revival. We're all watching Asprey, but when we come to church, we're sitting there half asleep. See, that's okay, Pastor John. Come on, I'm with you. I I refuse to give a nice little talk and let people sleep through it. Get some sleep on a Saturday night, amen? Don't be watching Netflix all night, and you might be awake when you come to church. That would be a good place to say praise the Lord. Winston Churchill said this. Men occasionally stumble over the truth. But most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had happened. Don't do that. Don't come to church and hear the word of God being preached. And just walk away as if nothing had happened. Come prepared to hear Bring a Bible, bring a notebook. I was so blessed in talking to a young man yesterday, talking about how some weeks he, he writes three or four pages of notes. In eternity, there will be people who will look at God and say, God, why did you not do a miracle in my life? Why did you not save my family? Why didn't you bless me with a home? Why didn't you cause my dreams to come to pass? And God will say, you heard it week by week by week, and it just went whew, over your head. And you missed your miracle every week because you didn't come with a heart to hear. Be doers of the word, not just hearers. As a pastor, I find this truth disturbing. I find it very sobering because I'm responsible to preach and to teach the word of God. And yet I'm mindful that just like the Pharisees, I could miss truth that is literally staring me in the face. Because I'm blinded by pride, ambition, or laziness. And so could you. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 8. For if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who will prepare himself for the battle? The battles are coming. Are you prepared? The NIV. Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? That is my call as a pastor is to give that clear call. The New American Standard. If the trumpet produces an indistinct sound, that's part of the problem with the church today, is we want to be so like the world, we are indistinct from the world. You see, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're called to be different. And so when you're going to church and they're all, you know, Guzzling alcohol after the service. And we embrace everybody. We're super tolerant. That's not a church. Or it's not the church that Christ wants. He's coming back for a spotless bride. Not a compromised bride. Not a a church that is indistinct from a world that is in rebellion and darkness. Pastor, I'm offended. I'm never going to come back here. Good. Good. If you're mad, something has hit you. You accept truth. You reject truth. Ultimately, you are responsible for what you do with truth. The call is going out in the spirit. The time is short and the need is great. I believe there's an urgency to this hour. I I honestly believe this. We say we want revival, but many are not ready for it when it will come. Because it will come first and foremost through the preaching. And there will be a boldness 
there will be a power, there will be a conviction that will cause people to run from the church as well as run to the church. And it all has to do with your heart. I'm determined to grow. I'm determined to grow because I see the effects of this spiritual battle all around me. Broken homes, broken hearts. Church, it's time for us to grow up. You can't be sitting in the chair saying, don't you dare, pastor. I will be offended. I do not care. I don't. I care about whether God is pleased with what I have said. Whether I've given him the glory that belongs to him. Whether I've been obedient to declare the word and to sow the seed. Whether that seed falls on good ground or bad ground is entirely up to you. It's time for us to grow up. The world needs to be one and we are running out of time. Romans 12 and 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, as far as depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the country, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals in his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so, as I finish, as the worship group come forward, if the days are evil and the generation is given over to evil, then how much more must we be given over to God and to his call in Jesus' name? How much more must we be given over to say, Lord, do what you want to do in my life in Jesus' name? And to do that, we have to grow up. That's why the book of Ephesians says that we be no more children. Ephesians 4 and verse 14. That's why God gave the fivefold ministry to play a part in maturing you as saints. My calling isn't just to make converts, it's to make disciples, disciples of Jesus Christ. Christ-like men and women who answer the call of God on their lives and who do His will in Jesus' name. So if you could stand to your feet today. I sense a sobriety in the room. I believe that, that that comes because of the Holy Spirit's convicting power. And you know, there's some of you here today and you're convicted about some things in your life. You know, God wants us to prepare our lives for His return. He's coming back. And to do that, we have to grow up. Like I said, that means you can't be perpetually offended. This is the perpetually offended generation. Constantly, you know pouring out our offense online about this, that, and the other. No, we need to be a praying generation. We need to be a broken generation. Broken at the sin and darkness and, and, and depravity that we see all around us. And this is a time for us to be distinct. That Bible verse I read there about indistinct from the world. How many times does that describe not just churches but believers who, who, who constitute those churches? That we're indistinct. We're, we're, we're not making a distinct sound. We, we just blend in all too well. We fit in all too well with a world that is in darkness and sin. God is calling us to be different. God is calling us to walk in light. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And so, Lord, we just thank you, Father, right now for your presence in this place. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Father, that you love every person. You love them dearly. But you love them enough to speak the truth to them, Lord. And I just thank you, Father, that you are dealing with our hearts because I believe you are going to do something great in our time, in our generation. But it starts with us dealing with our hearts. 
and dealing with those sins and those things that trip us up. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, but it doesn't end there. It addresses the, the cloud of witnesses in Hebrews chapter uh, 12. Let us lay aside every weight. And the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You know the reason why some of you constantly feel exhausted? It's not physical. It's not emotional. It's spiritual. It's spiritual because you are weighed down by sin you're weighed down by burdens you haven't dealt with in prayer you're weighed down because you're carrying that unforgiveness or that bitterness or you're indulging that secret sin and you don't understand that what you do physically affects you spiritually it affects you emotionally it is it even affects you physically sin will affect you physically and this is why the Bible says the wages of sin is death. There are so many men and women who die before their time, who go to an early grave because of the sin they indulged. And I believe in this day and our age, God is asking us to turn from these things and let them go. And, and, you know, strip off those weights, those sins, those burdens, those bondages in Jesus' name. And so I'm going to give an altar call for... Um, those of you who want to get free from things, whether it's habits or bondages or issues or whatever, this isn't about embarrassing anybody. But first and foremost, I want to give you an opportunity if you've never been saved. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you have an eternal soul. This is what people don't understand. Whether, whether they believe in God or not is irrelevant. You have an eternal soul. Jesus said, what does a prophet a man? To gain the whole world and lose his own soul. You know what he was saying? It really does not matter whether you get that promotion. It really doesn't matter whether you get that house. It really doesn't matter whether you make that million. If you are not saved, it means nothing. Because you will leave it all behind you. And you will go to an, an eternal hell. A place of literal fire and torment for all of eternity. I mean, you, you commit murder, you might get 30 years, but eventually you will come out. Eventually, you know, even if you come out in a box, eventually you will come out of that prison. But the Bible says that there is a, a place called hell where those who die without Jesus Christ will go. And I'm not saying this because I, I want to make anybody uncomfortable or condemn them, but I, I know God loves you. But most people are utterly oblivious. Of what awaits them in the next life. And I'm here as a man of God to warn you. If you're not saved, you need to get saved. This is your opportunity right now. What must you do to be saved? The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So with every head bowed, every eye closed for one moment, I want to ask you this question. And this was the question that drove all of these disciples to go to all of these various nations. With the message of the gospel. Because they had a vision of eternity. They didn't just have a vision of heaven. They had a vision of hell. And they knew what awaited men and women who die without Jesus Christ. And so I want to ask you today. Are you saved? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Have you surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? If you haven't, I want you to put your hand up today and say, yes, I want to ask Jesus into my life. I'm ready to receive Jesus as my Savior. Don't let pride stop you. If you know you're not right with God, if you know you've never accepted Him as your Lord, put your hand up high so I can see it. Amen. I see that hand. God bless you, young man. Is there anybody else here today you want to receive Jesus as your Savior? Don't walk out of here today if you're not right with God. You have an opportunity right now.